Well, good morning, uh, everyone, or afternoon, depending on uh, where you are, where you're joining us. Welcome to uh, the uh, Horch Dairyman webinar. This is the third in our uh, monthly series um, that we've started, and with us online today is Mike Hutchins, our co-host uh, down at the University of Illinois, and also Dr. Mark Stevenson. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin, who will be our presenter today. We're very uh, glad to have quite a number of you uh, listening in today. Um, and just a reminder that uh, you can uh, type in questions uh, as we go along, and uh, those will be emailed uh, uh, in, and uh, we can address them as time permits. And uh, without any further ado, Mike, do you have any more comments? Do you want to introduce Mark a little more thoroughly? Yes, I'd be happy to do that, Steve. Very good. And uh, I, too, uh, uh, welcome the group to our third uh, webinar here, sponsored by Hordes Dairyman. We we think we have a great one for today at this point, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our, our host and, of course, also recognize uh, Marielle. Marielle is uh, co-sponsoring the, the webinar, which helps us with the production costs as far as that goes, so our thanks to them. But we're very pleased that... Uh, Dr. Mark Stevenson uh, agreed to join us today to be part of the program, and you see his topic up there, uh, how milk production control plans compare. And of course, they just keep coming out of the out of work out of the woodwork all the time. Mark is a native in Michigan, so we won't hold that against him too badly, even though they got two teams in the, in the NCAA tournament. He got his uh, bachelor's and master's degree at Michigan State University and a PhD at, at Cornell. Uh, then he spent three years in River Falls, uh, University of Wisconsin River Falls, before returning back to Cornell. And at that position, he was the associate director of educational outreach uh, at Cornell on dairy markets and policy. And he was there for 17 years and then just uh, uh, joined uh, the University of Wisconsin staff here in July of 2010 with his title as Director of Dairy Policy Analysts at this point, which uh, construes a lot of things on uh, milk marketing, production costs, efficiencies, dairy products, and new things like that. Mark, we're very pleased to have you, and his comment to me was uh, all dairy all the time. So, Mark, we'll turn the program over to you, and uh, welcome to uh, our, our webinar series uh, today. Oh, thanks, Mike. I, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here and um, happy to present on this particular topic. There certainly have been a number of things that people have been talking about uh, with respect to uh, policies and what they think or hope might be possible in this next farm bill, so I'm going to try to address them. And, you know, when I think about uh, what the pressure points are for dairy policy in this uh, year ahead, year and a half, whatever it might turn out to be, I would conjecture that the big ones are milk price volatility. You know, 10 years ago, we were shocked by the way prices were starting to move, but those look like the good old days at this point in time. Uh, milk price volatility is getting uh, larger, if anything. But we've also had feed price volatility in the last few years that has uh, come into play a couple of times. Um, that, too, has become a question. Uh, export markets were relatively new to that in dairy products, but they're becoming an exciting growth area and occasionally they become a little bit terrifying for us as we've uh, found that uh, those markets can change rather rapidly too. There may be some other points uh, that are going to come up for discussion as you really look at the farm bill. There certainly are going to be other points uh, that impact dairy. Um, we're always having those, uh, whether it's with regard to dairy practices and uh, environmental uh, concerns or labor and other things, but but I think the milk price volatility is likely to be the one that really leads the uh, charge for us. So let's talk about volatility just a little bit. Uh, this is a chart that's looking at the U.S. all milk price over about a 10-year time period, a little bit more than that, and you can see the kind of volatility that I had indicated uh, we've been having. Uh, it looks both erratic, uh, as in really hard to predict, and Mike uh, made a few comments to that effect as we were getting ready for the uh, webinar that, in point of fact, uh, these milk prices are hard to forecast. And you can see also that from the lows of time periods like 2002, 3, 4, um, 2006 to the highs that we had, for example, in 08 here, the distance between the, the highs and the lows is getting to be uh, much bigger. So volatility has become a real issue, and I guess one of the questions that we often have with this is, in fact, is there anything that we can try to understand about volatility? 
uh, what are the sources of it, whether it's more predictable than perhaps we give it credit for being. The evidence seems to show that there really are two sources of milk price volatility. One of those is endemic, and by endemic I mean it's just internal to the dairy industry. It's part and parcel of the way we respond to things like price signals and put cows on or take them off or uh, have people who go out of business in the dairy industry. There are um, certainly causes of prices moving uh, rather substantially that have nothing to do with outside influences that we might call external shocks. We've had some really big external shocks as well, but if we're going to look at policies and those policies propose to deal with um, price volatility, you want to know whether they can handle both sources of this volatility, the, the kind that's interior and the kind that's external to the dairy industry. So we're going to take a look at that just a little bit. This graph looks really messy, so let me at least walk you through it uh, briefly. You can actually take a look at milk prices. Those very same milk prices that I showed you earlier, the all milk price over this time period, and looking at nothing but that, you can try to decompose those price movements into cycles. And if you do that, uh, this is something that's called spectral decomposition. It's spectrum like the wavelengths of light is a spectrum. You find that we have about four different cycles in our dairy industry, some of them more regular than others. For example, the yellow cycle that you see there is occurring every 12 months. There's a peak every 12 months, a trough every 12 months, and the amplitude of that, the height difference, is about plus or minus 40 cents a hundredweight. That's a seasonal cycle, and that cycle is very, very regular. In fact, if we look back to 1950, we had that same cycle in place in about the same magnitude. Back then, that seemed like really big volatility, but it was almost all seasonal. We also have a shorter cycle, uh, one that's occurring every nine months. We have one that's intermediate, that's occurring about every 26 months. And we have one that's become predominant, and that's occurring about every 36 months, and that's shown in the red line. And you can see that uh, the difference between the peak and the trough on the red line is getting much larger. And that's what's beginning to uh, hold sway on, on our total um, milk price swing. So, for example, if you pick the average milk price over this time period and then add up all of the values at any point in time, you might have a whole bunch of peaks lining up. And if a bunch of peaks line up, then you'll get a very high milk price. Or if a bunch of troughs are lining up at the same time, you'll get a very low milk price. So there are cycles that are complex in the dairy industry. And this is what I would call the endemic part of our uh, uh, milk price volatility. We also have external shocks to the dairy industry. It's not too hard to remember just a few years ago, back in uh, 2008, when we had uh, oil prices that hit $140 a barrel. When that happened, we had a uh, policy in place, or that was put into place, implemented, that wanted to give us a, um, a domestic uh, ethanol program and biodiesel program. And that kind of program had impacts, of course, on feed values. This chart that you're looking at here, uh, where I'm calling a supply shock, is a chart that is the NAS value for dairy ration. And that ration that they have is comprised of alfalfa hay, soybeans, and corn. And you'll notice that back in the first half of this time period, that value of the dairy ration was about $5 per 100 pounds of the ration concentrate. Now, in 2004, you had a small spike up for a short period of time, but for the most part, it was reasonably stable until we got out there toward that oil shock in 2007 and 8. That drove our prices up briefly of the total ration value to more than $10 per 100 pounds of ration. That was what we would call an external shock, something that happened outside our industry that you couldn't forecast, and it had a big impact on dairy and milk prices. I will say that um, those prices didn't stay there very long. They retreated fairly quickly. And we got down to what this chart is showing you is a, what many economists thought was perhaps a new plateau around a $7 per 100 pounds of ration. 
instead of five dollars per hundred pounds of ration. So just a shift upward in these values. Of course, if you look at the ration value today, it's very nearly ten dollars once again, and we expect it to go a little bit higher than it did last time and be more persistent, last longer. So we're involved in another supply shock, and it also has to do with oil, among other things, like strong international demand for feed grains. So um, supply shocks can happen. You can also have demand shocks, things that happen outside of our normal um, uh, venue. And here I'm showing you the value of U.S. dairy exports. Back in the first third of this time period, you see when um, our exports were relatively stable, um, we were exporting somewhere between 3 and 4 percent of our milk supply. And we had a small increase in dairy exports from about 2005 through 2007, where we were exporting somewhere between 5 and 6 percent of the U.S. milk supply. And then in 2007, late 2007 through 2008, we had a tremendous increase in exports. And at the peak time periods out there, we were exporting between 10 and 12 percent of our milk production. That's a large amount. That, of course, was followed by a global economic recession, a collapse, and since then we've rebuilt to uh, fairly strong levels of exports. So you can have influences from outside the dairy industry that um, are causing our milk prices to get pulled around quite a bit. And if we're going to have policy to control milk price movements or feed prices, then we need to know that they would control both these or help to moderate some of these internal um, endemic volatilities as well as these external shocks. There have been several producer groups around the country that have been looking at ways that we might manage volatility a little bit better. Now some of those management um, practices have been individual. So in other words, we'll put the onus on you um, to do a better job of purchasing insurance products like livestock gross margin insurance or uh, education to help people understand better what they could do through the futures markets to protect prices a little bit better. But there have been other policies that look to say, can we actually do something that would help control the prices themselves, not just what I receive for them? And a few of those have gained some traction. In the past year, there have been um, two bills that have been introduced uh, into Congress. There's been um, Senator uh, Representative Costa from California, who rep introduced a House a bill into the House, and Senator Sanders from Vermont also introduced a bill, a very similar bill. Those two would not take much to be reconciled and uh, could be put into law. And both of those were bills that had supply management aspects to them to help um, see if they couldn't um, moderate producer responses or over responses to high milk prices. National Milk Producers Federation uh, also has their Foundation for the Future program. That's probably the most predominant one being discussed at this point in time and is the most likely to be implemented. In fact, even many of the original supporters of the Costa Sanders bills have said um, National Milk's program would work, and so they've thrown their support in that direction. There's also been a program put forward by um, Agrimark out of New England Cooperative uh, that's called Marginal Milk Pricing Program. It's quite similar to National Milk Producers Foundation for the Future. And there have been a few others that have been tossed out, but a few of them have started to gain traction. I think that the metric that people use is whether or not the volatility has become so big that it disrupts the farm business uh, during these price troughs. It's one thing to have volatility and to try to plan for it and accommodate it. It's another when it gets to be so difficult to get through that we actually are, are expending more than we, we make up in the higher milk price years just to uh, tr try to get through it. So um, a number of producers, a surprising number of producers actually are, are indicating that we're at that point now and we need to do something about volatility with policy. Just to give you an idea about the cost of Sanders bills, there would be a production base in those bills, and that production base would be based on the same quarter's milk production from a previous year. 
So in other words, you would look back at your milk production a year ago and that would form the basis for your milk production. That would always roll forward over time. Uh, absolutely nobody has been proposing anything like the Canadian quota system where you have a hardened fixed quota that can really only be changed um, by the purchase of, of quota value. These quotas in all the programs that folks have been talking about would not be monetized nor would they be tradable. Um, so you would have the ability to grow your milk production base over time. You would have a trigger for different kinds of actions that would be based on a milk and feed price ratio and uh, those ratios of course change and there would be various levels of allowable growth from your base depending on the trigger value. So for example, if we had a very high milk price relative to feed price, this is a marketplace that's trying to tell dairy producers we want and need more <coughs> milk. And there would be an allowed level of growth and it would be more generous when the marketplace is calling for milk than when it says it really doesn't need it by having that ratio get smaller. When that's the case, then you might have very small allowable levels of growth or even negative levels of growth. You'd be able to exceed that growth limit at any time by paying a market access fee and those fees also differ and are based on how severe um, a milk feed price ratio actually is. So if you have a time period when it looks like uh, we really don't need so much milk, the fee could be quite high, as in maybe a dollar a hundred weight. And any of those fees that are collected um, would be collected to a central point and would be paid back to producers who didn't exceed the allowable growth limits. So effectively, you're trying to put a wedge between people who are growing rapidly and those who are willing to grow more slowly. Um, if you wanted to grow rapidly as in a one-time expansion, then you may have a year when you're paying uh, money to do that, uh, but after you've established your new base, you wouldn't be penalized uh, for that. So that's the basis of a cost of Sanders bill. The foundation for the future is probably the most discussed and uh, in my personal opinion the most likely uh, to be seriously considered right now in Congress. And foundation for the future is more ambitious than something like the cost of Sanders bills are. Um, what you're looking at here would be a new safety net program. So this is one aspect of it. We'd get rid of the milk income loss contracts or the MILC program. We would get rid of the dairy product price support program, uh, which we've had in place for a long, long time. And we would replace those two safety net programs with a margin protection program. And the margin protection program would look at a difference between the all milk price and a price uh, for feed. And that price for feed would be would be reflective of not just the cost of producing the 100 pounds of milk, but also carrying the additional dry animals and young stock that you need to have in a herd. There would also be an aspect of the foundation for the future that would be a reform of federal milk marketing orders. Um, just a couple of days ago, uh, National Milk has finally um, congealed what they were looking at in their federal milk marketing order reform and uh, they're trying to push back to two classes of milk, a fluid class or class one as we have known about it in the past and a manufacturing class of milk and they would look to discover those prices in different ways. Uh, we've currently been using for the last oh, almost not quite two decades but close to it now, uh, we've been using uh, something that's been called a product price formula. So we survey for what um, cheese values were in sales at wholesale or uh, whey products or non-fat dry milk or butter and then we try to back into or impute a value for the milk that was used to produce those products. And there are a number of people who feel like that's a system that's not working well and so let's effectively deregulate cheese plants, class 3 plants, all of them and anybody who is buying milk and making cheese and is buying at least a half million pounds of milk a day would be surveyed to find out what they had to pay to bring milk in the door of that plant. Those are the primary aspects of the milk marketing order reform. 
Uh, Mark, and the third part, Steve, excuse yes, me, Steve. can I just ask a, a question here? Uh, now, how does the, the proposals here on competitive pay pricing now, are they pretty similar to what we had before when we had the Minnesota-Wisconsin price series and the basic formula price? Well, you can think about them that way. Um, that's that's the idea that they want to go back to a price that's competitively determined in the marketplace. Uh, we could do that back with the old Minnesota, Wisconsin, or MW price because we had a large amount of grade B milk in the Upper Midwest, and grade B milk uh, doesn't qualify for Class One purposes and would never be regulated under a federal milk marketing order. So we could look at, at that milk and those plants that were buying that milk and say that this was competitively determined um, and we surveyed those plants. Well, grade B milk is a very small proportion of milk nowadays and we felt that that was an unreliable indicator of value quite a few years ago when we'd gone to this uh, product pay price. Now I think the idea is we liked what we had better with a competitive pay price, but we can't get it because almost all of our cheese plants, class three plants, are regulated. And you can't survey plants that are regulated. You'll only find, you know, that they're paying what you told them they had to pay. Um, so we would release them uh, from that obligation, and we would let them compete for milk, and we'd survey for it. So that's the okay. idea, Steve. Thank you. Sure. The third part of the Foundation for the Future program is the market stabilization part, and that is the supply management portion of that. They would use a three-month rolling base. In other words, we would look backwards to the most recent three-month time period that we had milk production on every farm floor, and that becomes uh, the base by which we uh, determine whether we need to be reducing uh, payments on milk or not. We would have a program that's not in place at all unless we were in a margin situation that was pretty tight. And the margin that they define is the difference between milk price and feed price, and it begins to kick in when that margin gets to be $6 a hundred weight or less. So if all your other costs, other than feed costs, are uh, less than $6 a hundred weight, uh, then you're probably all right. If they're more than that, then when you get to that $6 trigger, we would begin triggering an action. And the action that would be used at a $6 level would be that for two consecutive months, if you had that $6 trigger, we would now say that we're only going to pay you for 98% of your rolling base. And uh, under that kind of condition, the 2% the of your milk, or perhaps a little bit more if you've been growing, um, that wouldn't be paid for if you still shipped it to the plant would be sold um, to the plant and the plant would pay for it but you wouldn't receive that money. That money goes into a collective pot and the money would be used for this penalty milk uh, for demand stimulating programs and the idea behind that would be perhaps that we would buy dairy products off the market like cheese for example and give them away into non-commercial channels, uh, places that wouldn't otherwise buy cheese, uh, perhaps food bank programs, for instance. And so we're doing two things then. We're, we're both trying to encourage a reduction of milk production, but if you're going to sell it anyway, then we're going to use that money to enhance demand uh, in the short run. That's the basic idea behind Foundation for the Future. The marginal milk pricing plan, as I indicated, is pretty similar to the foundation for the future. It does use a margin-based trigger, the same one that National Milk is suggesting, but instead of $6, this one would start at $7 per hundred weight. Um, if we hit that trigger for two consecutive months, then the uh, a reduction would begin to kick in. And we would require a reduction of 1% of your milk supply for each $1 below that trigger level. So at $7, you would only be paid for 99% of your milk. At $6, you would only be paid for 98% of your milk, etc. And the difference between those milk price or the, uh, the milk that is, is shipped is not zero. Um, foundation for the future will pay you nothing for that extra milk 
marginal milk pricing will pay you the difference between the all milk price in that area and the class 3 price so you'd receive something for your milk but effectively the class 3 price um, would be money that would be collected for the penalty milk would also be used on demand enhancing programs so uh, there are real strong similarities but some unique differences with the margin milk pricing plan to put them kind of side by side as I've done in here uh, on this particular chart you can see the three programs foundation for the future on the first column margin milk pricing on the second and Costa Sanders on the right and on the rows we have safety net foundation for the future would replace MILC and dairy product price support program with margin insurance the other two programs wouldn't change those they would keep MILC and dairy product price support program price discovery would be different under federal order reforms in the foundation for the future and no proposed changes under marginal milk pricing or the cost of Sanders programs the supply management portions are all just a little different as I've just walked through and talked to you about and we use the funds a little bit differently under the programs both foundation for future and marginal milk would purchase items and give them away under cost of Sanders those monies would be returned directly to producers who did not um, produce more than their allowable growth so those are the key plan differences real question is do these programs work or would they work so let me give you a little bit of modeling results when we've done some very complex modeling of these programs all three would reduce the variability in the all milk price all three of the programs would reduce government expenditures or taxpayer dollars and I'll show you why that's the case just a little bit later the programs do have different impacts on the average all milk price received by producers and the programs can have different impacts on the various classes of milk so this might speak just a little bit to some regional differences that you could have in prices under the different programs and the programs do have slightly different impacts on total product sales but not much this is a graph that begins to show you what happens to the all milk price under these I'm just really showing you two different programs the orange line on here is what we would call the base this is a model generated simulation of what we think uh, would be happening to milk prices if we kept the same programs in place and didn't do anything differently you'll see it would be projecting a pretty big price by 2014 uh, followed by another kind of collapse in price by all mid 2015 um, however uh, we have two programs that we're looking at just the cost of Sanders program and the foundation for the future I'm not putting marginal milk pricing in here because it makes the graphs too cluttered but you'll see that um, the programs are all started in the year 2012 that's when we would normally be having a new farm bill and uh, so we we said that the programs would be implemented at that point and begin to do their thing you'll notice that right out of the shoots there's a difference between what happens with cost of Sanders and what happens with the foundation for the future which is the black line um, the foundation for the future almost immediately turns the price around uh, in a different direction cost of Sanders takes a little while to start to be implemented and as you project on out there a little ways you'll see that the amplitude the the peaks and the troughs all oh, by the time you get to 2015 and beyond on both those programs are considerably less than the baseline with no change in programs the volatility seems to be happening more frequently under a foundation for the future but it doesn't have the same kind of impact uh, that uh, it would without any change in programs cost of Sanders is a more gentle type of program and we actually have a slightly lower average all milk price with that program um, in part because producers are responding to uh, less risky uh, milk price uh, changes we also wanted to look at the program not just with that endemic volatility which is what I showed you before without shocks this particular chart is showing you uh, two shocks that have been imposed on the system 
about in 2016, uh, we impose a feed price shock, much like we had before. And then we also impose a year later on top of that, a large positive shock in demand for dairy products, followed by a collapse in those things. And you'll see what happens with the baseline volatility. It looks probably a lot more like the kind of volatility we've actually seen. The programs uh, do help to moderate that price volatility, but pretty clearly um, they've still got a fair amount of volatility in the prices. It's just that they don't go quite as deep for the most part and they don't last quite as long. One measure of you know, whether or not they're actually reducing volatility is something that we call the cumulative average deviation from prices. That's starting to be measured in this year 2013 and the orange line here is showing you this baseline which is fairly substantial and it shows you the other two programs, the marginal milk and cost of Sanders, both of which are essentially saying we have half the volatility with either of those two programs that you would have um, with the programs that we currently have in place. So they do appear to be effective. When we look at the cumulative deviation with the shocks in place, you'll also notice that they reduce the variation in prices, but not by half, maybe more like by one third. So uh, the impact is, is still fairly strong for shocks, but they, they certainly are helping along the way. They're keeping the volatility down. The amount of milk marketed, in other words, sold by dairy producers uh, into the marketplace is different under the programs. I would like to have you focus in particular on the black line, the foundation for the future. That black line, uh, you'll notice, has some very sharp kinks in it. Um, so, for example, the program comes into place in 2012, and you may remember that the milk price started to return, spike back upwards here. But this is showing you that happened because almost immediately we had a reduction in the amount of milk that was being sent to the market uh, as a result. And in 2013, you'll see it jumps back up because that's come off. And you'll notice a few more of those fairly jagged kind of uh, lines along the way. But I think the thing to notice here is that all three, whether you're talking about the base or Costa Sanders or Foundation for the Future, doesn't change the general direction nor long-term deviation in uh, milk production. We're increasing in milk production. We're just moderating it somewhat, not getting the real big peak followed by the troughs in production or prices. Exports have been one of the things that people have been concerned about with a supply management program. Um, our growth in milk production and even some of the real highs that we've had in prices, not too different from this year actually, have been largely the result of our opportunities to export dairy products and people don't want that to go away. And this is showing you that we don't expect it to go away. We inspect um, exports of cheese to uh, continue to grow. In point of fact, under the cost of Sanders program, we're exporting a little bit more cheese than we would under the base program that we have now. And in Foundation for the Future, we're exporting a little less. The reason for that is that Foundation for the Future is buying cheese off the domestic market and that keeps cheese prices propped up a little bit higher. And when cheese prices are a little bit higher, we aren't quite as attractive to cheese exports. In cost of Sanders, we're actually producing a little bit more milk. Much of it finds its way to the cheese vat. Those cheese prices are a little bit lower, and so we're exporting more cheese. But not a lot. Um, for the most part, the trends are pretty similar. Foundation for the future, um, and or excuse me, the uh, non-fat dry milk exports under Foundation for the Future look much more jagged than the others. And this is no small part because the program will kick in and then it will kick out. And we imagine that the non-fat dry milk and butter plants are likely to be the residual claimants on the milk supply. So those are plants that are operating either with milk or without milk. And that changes the amount that we're able to export under those products. 
otherwise between cost of sanders and the base program not much different Let's talk about government expenditures very different for the programs if we continue with MILC program and with uh, the dairy product price support program you'll see here that over this time period from 2012 through 2019 that the baseline is projecting something like a three billion dollar cumulative expenditure um, on these uh, safety net programs. Cost to Sanders doesn't change those. You still have MILC and you still have the dairy product price support program but because you're keeping the milk price from falling into the ranges where MILC begins to kick in then you're not expending as much money under those programs so the expenditure is, is well less than half of what you have under our base program under foundation for the future it's even more dramatic foundation for the future um, is doing much the same that cost of Sanders is in terms of keeping prices out of the range where those margin insurance payments would kick in but you're also collecting some additional buy-up under the uh, insurance opportunities for foundation for the future and those are actually revenues that make this at some points go to negative so the government could actually be holding a surplus of dollars as a result of sales of insurance product under a foundation for the future so it really is a low-cost program for the government under this scenario now mind you this is not with the shocks this is just the endemic volatility when you take a look at the shocks uh, it does look a bit different um, the base program is higher the cost of Sanders is a little bit higher and the foundation for the future is quite a bit higher why because you get into the margin situations where you'd be making a, a fair amount of payments to dairy producers but under both of the uh, supply management programs the total expenditure for government dollars is still much less than with our current base programs and this may be quite important as we head into a farm bill discussion when budgets are actually fairly tight so just to summarize this part of the program all of these programs would reduce but not eliminate price volatility all three programs would reduce government expenditures programs do have somewhat different impacts on the average all milk price received by farmers as I mentioned before slightly higher under foundation for the future slightly lower under cost of Sanders and the programs have different impacts on class 3 and 4 prices um, again slightly higher on class 3 prices under foundation for the future and slightly lower um, for class 4 prices under foundation for future the programs do have slightly different impacts on total product sales as well a um, little bit more product sold um, under Costa Sanders because we're producing uh, more milk under that program so foundation for the future produces slightly less milk and yields slightly higher price it comes from product purchases and butter and non-fat is highly variable class 3 price is somewhat higher and class 4 price is somewhat lower just as a summary assumptions matter on these kind of programs I would say that there's nothing that's inherently good or bad about one program versus another um, and you can get different outcomes if you vary some of the parameters for example the growth that was suggested under cost of Sanders was not very restrictive it was something like two to three percent of allowed growth uh, if you're growing rapidly I mean doubling your herd size then you'll be penalized for a short period of time but our ordinary growth on farms the year-to-year -year growth uh, would be accommodated by uh, what's available in cost of Sanders but if you tightened it you can get a higher average milk price under foundation for the future or marginal milk pricing you can spend the money that's collected in different ways or on different products and if you do that then you get different kinds of outcomes there so again assumptions do matter on those programs we also assume that uh, the way that producers would react and by react I mean what well if you're not being paid for a portion of your milk under foundation for the future would you ship any of it uh, to the marketplace and receive nothing for it uh, we think that some of that milk would actually be shipped 
and the reason would be if you're going through an expansion and get hit in the trigger time you may still want to do that to continue to build your base uh, so we assume that 35 percent of the penalty milk would still be marketed um, the rest of it the 65 percent wouldn't be the other thing that would be of a question is how much subsidy the government would provide for margin insurance and how producers would react to that we assume that 60 percent of producers would buy up from a four dollar margin which costs nothing for individual producers to a six dollar margin protection and that that would cost about 14 cents per hundred weight and they would do that on about 45 percent of their milk that's our assumption and it could be different it would depend on how much subsidy I think uh, the government would be willing to provide so these I think are some of the primary uh, policies that are being uh, talked about or discussed for the farm bill let's talk about the farm bill itself for just a few minutes we're soon going to have a report from the uh, uh, diet committee um, the dairy industry advisory committee and it will be an important document it's a document that advises the secretary of agriculture on what might be done for dairy what the big problems are as they see that and the secretary of agriculture is likely to draft a document that would be suggestive of policy changes for the farm bill but in point of truth um, the administration or the secretary of agriculture only signs policy into law they don't draft legislation uh, that has to come from the house or the senate so uh, in, in some respects this is going to be an important document but it really won't give us um, solid direction for a farm bill that has to come from Congress what is a farm bill well it's legislation that amends otherwise permanent legislation of the 1949 Act and that's still in effect today so we often hear people talk about if we don't renew a farm bill or get a new one then we have to go back to the original act and that's true it's also usually what we would call omnibus legislation which really means we're passing a whole bunch of bills with one single one and uh, that's true of the farm bill we pass a lot of different pieces of legislation as a farm bill it used to be a four-year proposal in other words every four years we had a farm bill until 1996 the fair act and we changed that time period to roughly seven years or five years or excuse me seven years because it's a painful process hard to do and any new bill and language that comes up requires this careful balancing of what's needed on the part of agriculture and what dairy farmers or other farmers want what other people like consumers or environmentalists want what we can do legally we have treaty restrictions that wouldn't allow us to do some things and what we can afford to do the budget if we look back to just 1996 the uh, concept was that dairy or all markets agricultural markets were strong we had a high baseline out there uh, the plan spending without change to policy so since markets are strong and a high baseline why don't we try to phase out subsidies and supports for all kinds of agriculture over the life of that farm bill and we'll be mar in a free market situation by the year 2000 well for dairy it meant let's phase out the dairy price support program let's reform federal orders and that's when we first got MILC but it wasn't permanent legislation we got that in a <coughs> small part because uh, we were also trying to put some salve on the uh, Northeast for the loss of the dairy compacts so this was freedom to farm in 2002 we went to our, our next farm bill and I'm casually calling this freedom to spend uh, different concepts now markets are now weak they aren't strong like they were before but budgets are strong so what do we do uh, we can have these transition payments that were now called direct payments they made production strong but prices weak and farms didn't want free markets when prices are low so bring back the subsidies and supports for dairy it meant bring back the price support program at the former level and let's continue MILC 2007-8 farm bill maybe we can call this tongue-in-cheek freedom to pay later 
Uh, the idea was that markets were strong, output prices were high, but so were input prices. We had a weak dollar, short energy, strong international demand, but budgets are weak. We have to get creative. And there were a lot of loose policy threads, but we're going to worry about all that stuff later. We only changed what had to be changed. We kept almost all of the previous programs we had, but we had to find new ways to help farmers. For dairy, it meant we changed modestly the price support program to the dairy product price support program. We set minimum purchases, but not exactly a support for milk. We changed the trigger prices on thresholds. We established sellback prices. And we renewed MILC with some changes, like higher caps, for example, and a higher percentage payout during that time period. Well, OK, so now we're down to 2012 agricultural policy. What are we going to do this time? We probably want to continue to support agriculture, but how is a really big question. And we anticipate that there are going to be a lot more challenges from critics of spending in general and ag agricultural spending specifically. Are we going to aggressively try to protect prices? Or now are we talking about protecting margins instead of just a price? I think that's where we're at right now. Are we talking about insurance, where producers might have some skin in that game as opposed to just um, a price support kind of program? The state of the economy is going to make a big difference. Budget issues, being what they are, suggest that we can't spend a lot of money on dairy policy. By some estimates, it may be as little as $79 million annually would be dairy's fair share in this next farm bill. That may sound like a lot of money, but over all of dairy, that's a drop in the bucket. What's happening in the rest of the world? Do we have trade opportunities and the general state of the dairy situation? I think there are also new political realities. Um, we may have a three-party system right now. I know it's still Republicans and Democrats, but even within the Republican Party, um, the Tea Party looks a lot different than more established Republicans. And we haven't really settled out very well how this system works. The House leadership is different for the um, Ag Committee. We have a different party in charge and a different Ag Chairman. The Senate leadership is the same, still Democratic, but we have a different Ag Chairman. Debbie Stabenow is the Ag Chairman of the Senate Committee. So 2012, that will be approaching shortly, is a major election year. We've already heard about Republican frontrunners um, throwing their hat in the ring. And it's not hard to imagine that under this kind of scenario at all, that we don't have a 2012 farm bill, that it would be put off for a year. If it gets, if we do get a 2012 farm bill, think about the environment. We're facing better milk prices this year, but for producers who are buying most of their feed, it's still poor margins. Under that kind of scenario, it could be a strong push for what would be a really low cost supply management program like Foundation for the Future. That might have a better chance under this kind of timing. If it gets pushed off until 2013 instead of 2012, I think we'll probably have better milk prices then. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if the price of feed grains comes down some. We'll know a lot more when we get the uh, planting intention shortly. If that's the case, there'll be less outcry to fix a program and a tough sell, I think, for supply management programs. So it depends on just what kind of conditions we have in place in the dairy industry. But I still think we'll have loss of the dairy product price support program. And if we keep MILC as a safety net, there'll probably be some tinkering there to reduce budget exposures. And finally, I think maybe one of the more intriguing things is whether we have dairy policy occurring even before a farm bill. Uh, you may remember that when uh, Colin Peterson was chair of the Ag Committee in the House, he was pushing for an early farm bill. Um, he held listening sessions very early, but of course all that changed last November for him. But at the urging of national milk producers, he may try to introduce standalone legislation as a dairy bill. And Lucas has indicated that he may let the bill come forward, Lucas being current chair of the uh, House Ag Committee. 
Uh, Debbie Stabenow, as I understand it, has also indicated she would be willing to submit such a bill in the Senate. So it may be possible for us to be thinking about dairy policy even separate from the farm bill. That would be a lot of changes for us, um, but nevertheless, um, certainly something possible. And what do we get? I don't know. You know, <laughs> take my track record in projecting milk prices, and you can probably imagine how well I do projecting policy. But I would take some questions if we've got just a little time. Well, very good, uh, Mark. It's gone very, very well. Let's uh, do two housekeeping things, and then we have several questions that are that are posted here at this stage of the game. I know some of our people will be leaving us shortly here. Remember, our next uh, webinar will be April 11th. It's going to be on fine-tuning dairy rations uh, at the uh, same time with myself. And then on uh, May 9th, uh, we have uh, invited Dr. Rick Grant from the Minard Institute to join us on impact behavior on, on feeding cows. It should be a a, a, a great uh, a webinar as well. So um, we, Mike, have, we have one we more. To, Mark, Mark, can you move us one more slide forward? Sure. I think you have. There we go. Very good. So we want to thank uh, Mark, and, and Mark, we'll open up to questions now. Do you want me to read the questions, or can you see the questions? I can't see the questions, so I'm going to ask if you would please read them. Okay, uh, one of the and we'll just take them as they've come in here at this point. Is is the feed price ratio based on national data or is it a state and regional uh, differential? No, the feed price um, value under Foundation for the Future would be based on national uh, values. In fact, they would be values that were mostly harvested from futures market data for corn and for soybean meal. The alfalfa hay would come from the NAS. Um, uh, alfalfa hay uh, uh, prices that farmers have received. So uh, those prices are all national. That would just be a trigger that would suggest when the dairy industry has gotten into a bad situation. It wouldn't be regional. So uh, this is the Hutchins question. We, we, we watch corn prices varying as much as $2 a bushel between Florida and, say, Wisconsin. Uh, so, so that means Florida people get hurt a little bit on that deal, or, or do we get an advantage? You know, we see those lo local prices varying that much. Same thing applies to the alfalfa. Well, and the same thing applies to milk prices. Um, and milk prices vary by more than $2 from Florida to here. Uh, so, you know, in general, you, you're, you're really trying to look at, I mean, most of the, the time period with uh, dairy, um, these boats are all floating on the same tide, and that's what we're concerned about. There would be some regional impacts potentially for these programs. I did indicate differences in class three or class four prices from one program versus another. And I think that's where you're likely to get more regional impacts than you are just differences between um, feed prices. Uh, Mark, Jason raised the question, and uh, I think you can refer to it. Uh, what would happen to someone who just started to dairy with, uh, with the three bills? Okay. Um, under the Foundation for the Future program, uh, there all of the programs, should I say, uh, have uh, have legislation or, or have language at least that would allow for new entrants into the dairy industry. They don't want to have any problems or issues with somebody getting into that. However, um, when you are first establishing yourself under Foundation for the Future, you wouldn't have a long-term history in milk production and that wouldn't allow you the uh, margin payment until you got to a next farm bill time period. At the next farm bill, you would have a production history, and at that point in time, you would use that history as the basis for the payment. But otherwise, um, you're rapidly getting into the situation where you would be establishing your milk production, and you would not be paying any penalties for that. So it's, it's quite possible uh, to get in uh, to new milk production under all of these without penalty and establish yourself. Okay. Another question comes in. How will, uh, where are the processing trade groups feel about these plans? Uh, uh... Well, I think that's pretty easy to, uh, <laughs> to come away with a nearly uh, substantial uh, answer that they do not like the idea of the supply management programs. 
Um, I did try to show you that our best modeling efforts uh, indicate that we don't think there'll be major deviations uh, in terms of milk available to processing plants or in products produced, but there'll be some. I think the biggest concern that uh, dairy processors have is that you now have potentially very powerful tools that are put into the hands of folks to make decisions. So for example, if you decided that, you know, it's not just the volatility that's an issue, it's actually whether the price is adequate or not. I mean, is it high enough on average? You've now got a tool in your hand that allows you to ratchet back the milk supply a little bit and raise that average price. And that's something that processors would find really quite troubling. Uh, so it's the concept probably more than the actual implementation that's been proposed, in my opinion. So Mike, this is... Go ahead. go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say that I'd like to make some comments and then ask another uh, question of, uh, of Mark here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of, uh, while, while so many of you are still online, I want to thank all of, all of you who have uh, uh, joined us today on this webinar. We appreciate uh, your interest very much. Uh, you may be receiving a six-question survey that will just take you just a couple of minutes to fill out. Uh, It'll be emailed to you that uh, your uh, participation in that will help us a great deal in making sure that we have webinars in the future that are of, uh, an, of uh, help and interest to you. And let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Mark for the fine job that you've done here today and Mike for your co-hosting. And also, again, we want to thank uh, Muriel and their Best of Class uh, program for their sponsorship today. And now, uh, Mark, my question is uh, the... Uh, we know that the budget situation in Washington is is uh, is going to be tight. Uh, that's going to be a factor. Let, uh, could you comment a little bit on the type uh, of the government uh, uh, or the budget impact of the difference? You, you say that there were some differences, but like in the case of uh, uh, Foundation for the Future, there'll be the margin insurance uh, program, which would be uh, uh, have some uh, some government monies. I I understand. If we keep some of the other programs, or if we keep price support, uh, uh, then we'll still have perhaps some CCC purchases. So, uh, could you kind of comment on what the nature of the government uh, uh, budget expense will be for the different programs, and 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 whether or not those differences may uh, influence Congress? Sure. Um, the uh, two programs, marginal milk pricing and cost to Sanders, kept in place the safety net programs we currently have, those being price support and MILC. However, in looking at the, uh, the programs going forward, projecting the volatility, we, we find that uh, dairy product price support programs seldom come into play. So it's not often that we're getting down to something like a, uh, a $9.90 milk price. Um, but we are quite often getting into the range where MILC payments are kicking in. And that's the source of the expenditure to the government under those two programs. Under Foundation for the Future, you're get, getting rid of both current safety net programs, replacing it with margin insurance. And that margin insurance is fully subsidized at a $4 margin. So this is actually a pretty bad dairy kind of situation. We got into that in 2009, but if producers didn't do anything else, they would be paid dollar for dollar um, the difference between uh, a low a margin below the $4 and up to the $4 point. Producers can also buy up uh, to higher levels of insurance. Um, it's not actuarially fair, meaning that the government is going to subsidize or would be subsidizing those premiums at some level. and. So if you wanted a $5 insurance uh, or margin insurance, then you'd have more heavily subsidized than if you wanted a 6 or 7 or an $8 uh, margin covered. And that becomes the source of the payments for the federal government uh, under okay. Foundation for the Future. Those can Thank kick you. in fairly high um, when we get into a real shock type of situation, but under ordinary um, volatility, it would seldom be paying out. 
Mike, it looks like we have time for maybe another question or two. Sure. Um, yep. Uh, Dan raises a question, uh, uh, Mark, here and says, uh, how would any of these three options uh, ha have uh, build some monetary value in them? And, and what prevents it from having like value in quotas in Canada? Any comments on that? Sure. Um, I think the, uh, the biggest reason that they would not be able to really take on significant value is that you have this rolling base that's increasing all of the time. Um, so that provides you with very little opportunity to capitalize value into them. Most of the other pro or most of the programs also allow very limited transfer of that quota value, if you will, that base value. Um, if you were to sell the farm to another producer, then that value would transfer to the new producer. Uh, but you couldn't sell that farm and go somewhere else and start up and expect that you would have the same quota without penalty. Um, so you can transfer within the family. Uh, so there are many efforts that have been made to make sure that there's a very limited opportunity to capitalize value. And since there really can't be paper value uh, per se because no quota exists to transfer, the only way that you would capitalize value would be into assets. So if the quota actually went with the physical plant and location, maybe you could say there's some small capitalization into those buildings, uh, but that would be the extent to which um, that would happen or occur. Mark, a related question from Wendy asks, what about the events in Japan? Will they have some impact on, on the dairy markets as you see it? Yeah, I think they probably will. Um, very short term. One of the things that uh, is likely to happen is that as Japan tries to recover, um, they have so much of the manufacturing capacity in that region um, that is not going to be able to produce things for a period of time that their demand for oil is going to be less than it was before. So there'll be a little bit more mo oil um, and perhaps even natural gas on the uh, world markets than was available before. That's short term. Longer term, I guess my concern is that whenever we have a very large catastrophe like this, not all of the uh, problems are borne by the country that experienced that. Uh, other countries will contribute dollars and there'll be real costs involved in trying to help Japan recover. And the concern you have is whether or not this puts a fairly, uh, well, brittle, I guess, um, economic recovery in a country like this into a further tailspin. Um, it's not likely to do much, but if anything, it, it would have those kind of uh, implications. We still sell some products, uh, dairy products, to Japan, and that may be disrupted for a period of time, but they're not a big destination for us. Um, Japan is largely supplied by Australia with a little bit coming into there from New Zealand. So uh, those, I think, are the, the most likely impacts. Mark, one more question here, because there's two left. Mark, one has to do with, the, he, he cites, uh, James cites the National Milk Producers proposal, and he says, any impacts on jobs at the processing level? Uh, any job losses from the end at that point? Oh, boy. You know, I think fairly minimal. The one thing I think that you have to look at and, and wonder about is what happens at a butter powder plant. As I indicated, they're usually the residual claimant on the milk supply. And if we get into these trigger situations where producers actually decide to not send 2% you know, of their milk to the marketplace, then all of that ultimately falls back to those butter powder plants. And they operate erratically, maybe flat out, you know, one month and um, turned off basically the next. That makes it expensive to own and operate those plants and that would be a problem for some of the co-ops that uh, do own them in my opinion uh, and potentially of course has job implications for the people employed there. Mark, I was intrigued in one of your examples you used 14 cents and 45% uh, is your assumption. What was your logic in picking those numbers uh, that 14 cents was the insurance, I think the, the cost, and you'd cover 45% of production? Uh, well, yeah, it was a heroic assumption, but we weren't actually the ones that made it. <laughs> um, 
FAPRI used those same numbers in analysis that they had done, and um, FAPRI also relied on some work uh, that was done by a consultant um, for National Milk that, that provided those kind of estimates of numbers. Now, we will not know at all what the level of subsidization is going to be or the actual costs of the premiums until um, something like this legislation would be scored by Congressional Budget Office. They're the ones that would have to determine what the cost of the premiums and subsidization would be. But this was a best guess at it. Okay. So it may be ballpark figure, but I certainly wouldn't put that into uh, uh, you know gospel. And I think for our listeners, because I want to be sure I heard this correctly, Mark, and that is when we look at feed costs per hundred, we're adding our heifers and dry cows into that. So you know, a lot of farms are right now at $7 feed cost, but when you put heifers and dry cows, that probably gets close to that $10 number. Uh, is that a correct, uh, is what I've just said, is that correct? Yes, um, they've, they've made the uh, calculation to say that, look, we, aren't, we shouldn't be just thinking about covering the cost of producing 100 pounds of milk from a dairy cow. Um, we ought to be looking at uh, the rest of the uh, animals that we carry with that cow, the sick animals, uh, the dry animals, and uh, the heifers that are going along with that. So it's going to differ on every farm. You know, if you're carrying more than uh, replacement numbers of heifers, obviously your, your real feed values might be higher than folks who are selling animals, but on average they're trying to cover just uh, all of the costs related to feed for a dairy farm. Well, Mark, I think that concludes all our questions. We had a regional one, but you had covered that one a bit earlier. And uh, and some things on Congress, you've covered that as well. So, Mark, uh, thanks very much, per personally and professional, for your efforts today on this excellent webinar here. Our, our, certainly our thanks to uh, Marielle for their support. We appreciate that very much. And, Steve, uh, thanks to Hordes Dairyman for sponsoring this. Both Jim and I appreciate the commitment to this. And hopefully we'll see most of you back here uh, uh, in April. With that, we'll stand adjourned. We're five minutes over. So so uh, have a good one. Thanks to everybody and goodbye.